Good evening. Welcome to the Conservation Center for Art and Historic Artifacts 2020 Open House. We'll begin in just a minute after all the guests have had opportunity to enter the virtual space. I just wanna give a moment for everyone to get here. If you like, while we're waiting, um, please feel free to type a note into the chat box and let us know from where you're joining us this evening. It's really a treat for us to know that we're with friends and colleagues from near and far. Hello, I am seeing some friendly names in the chat box. Well, a warm, warm welcome to everyone. Uh, if this is your first evening that you're joining us tonight, we are thrilled that you ch have chosen the final evening of the four to be with us. And if you are participating with us tonight after being with us also for all of the previous evenings or any of the previous evenings as well, I think you get a biggest fan status and thank you for coming back. Traditionally, all of us at the Conservation Center for Art and Historic Artifacts look forward to the true highlight of our year, the open house. Although we cannot welcome you in person to our 11,000 square foot facility in the Rittenhouse neighborhood of Philadelphia, we will happily bring this special gathering to you virtually. I am Stephanie Schwartz Bailey, the Education Program Manager and Preservation Consultant at the Conservation Center for Art and Historic Artifacts, often referred to as CCAHA. CCAHA is a nonprofit institution serving cultural institutions, corporations, and private clients from across the nation. We conserve specifically paper art and artifacts, books, and photographs. We conduct planning and assessment activities to support long-term preservation efforts, offer housing and framing, and digital imaging. I am speaking to you this evening, as are my colleagues from CCAHA who are joining me on ancestral Lenny Lenape land, which spreads as far east as Philadelphia and New Jersey. I acknowledge with gratitude the land itself and honor the diverse indigenous peoples who previously, currently, and in future are connected to it. The sky is dripping buckets of cold rain tonight in Philadelphia, again, for the second or third night. And if I were welcoming you to CCHA in person, I would suggest you shake off your umbrella and shake off the chill. And I would bid you welcome to the warmth of our historic building with its red brick walls, lofted ceilings, and clear story windows with glowing views of the Philadelphia skyline. You could wander through the laboratory to observe conservation treatment in progress and chat with staff and talk to folks at their benches and their desks. Alas, instead, I'm going to invite you to settle in cozily to your armchair or your sofa. And with thanks for joining us here in this virtual space, prompt you to explore for the next hour, a succession of presentations. So hear an introduction by the CCAHA board chairperson, then meet our sponsors. Following that, please enjoy a pre-recorded video demonstration of conservation treatment and also a very special pre-recorded interview that announces the highlight of CCAHA educational programming for 2021. And lastly, you may participate in a live Q&A session with staff moderated by a CCAHA board member. 
lots of fun things to do in the next hour. Most of us have become pretty familiar with the Zoom platform by this time. But as a reminder, uh, this is a Zoom webinar. So your audio and your video are both disabled. But down at the bottom of the screen, you will see some buttons um, along that, that footer bar that are active for your use. The first button is the chat button. Please do type your comments here. Uh, we love to see them. Also, if you have any concerns of a technical troubleshooting nature, go ahead and put them in the chat box. My colleague, Jason Hen, who is the manager of marketing and external affairs and the mastermind of the open house is monitoring the chat box. Down at the bottom of the screen, you can also see uh, the Q&A button. Um, and this is the button that you may use to pose questions directly to conservators and staff. A CCAHA board member is going to be looking into the Q&A section for your questions to fuel the conversation when I call everyone back at the end of the webinar for a live conversation. Lastly, at the top right of your screen, you might like to set the view to speaker view because that will allow the maximum amount of screen space for you to view the videos tonight. This event is being recorded and the link to each evening of the open house is going to be available on the CCAHA social media accounts within about a week. So check back next week. Um, as a side note, there is closed captioning included in the videos this evening. Um, each of the pre-recorded videos should have those closed captions coming up automatically when the video starts. However, if that doesn't happen as the automation promises that it will, um, rest assured that the recordings of the videos that will be posted next week will have the closed caption in the full text. So you should be able to see um, the closed captions definitely by next week. So now I welcome Larry Massaro, CCAHA board chairperson to lead off the evening and to introduce our generous sponsors. Hi, Larry. Hi, Stephanie, how are you? I'm very well, it's all up to you now. All right, um, as Stephanie mentioned, my name is Larry Massaro. I am a member of the Conservation Center board and, um, and I'm here to, uh, to give you a second welcome this time on behalf of the Conservation Center board. Welcome to all of our attendees, uh, to all the people in our audience for attending this um, virtual open house. And unfortunately, as Stephanie mentioned, this is not the kind of open house where we can offer you as we usually do, wine and cheese and finger food. But nevertheless, the objects are still interesting. The, the conversation will still be interesting. The conservators are still um, impressive people and it's always interesting to hear from them. My primary job this evening, however, is to thank our very generous sponsors, and there are five of them. Uh, your part-time controller, Innovative Document Imaging, the Cheshire Law Group, and Diversified Storage Solutions, all very generous sponsors, and our lead sponsor for our virtual open house all week is uh, Atelier FAS. And I'm going to read for you some information from Atelier FAS that could be very useful for a number of um, people in our audience. Atelier FAS Group is a full service, second generation fine art services company based in Delaware, Pennsylvania, and New York, and currently expanding to Washington, DC. Atelier practices the highest standards of quality control and security in the safe transport and packing of fine arts and antiques and in the crafting and in crafting museum quality installations. Since our founding in 1870, or in 1876. In 1986, we've excelled in handling complex installations for art museums, estates, historic houses, and ethnographic and archaeological repositories. Atelier's team of former museum and gallery registrars understand the importance of clear documentation and collection stewardship, expedient project management, and working within a client's budget and timeline. Atelier has 150,000 square feet of museum quality storage facilities on the East Coast, one in Philadelphia, the other in Newcastle, Delaware, with a satellite facility in New York, 
plus a 25,000 square foot fabrication shop for custom crating. Our 90 plus employees include 50 full-time art handlers and 12 art technicians. In addition, Atelier boasts a full fleet of 15 high security climate controlled air ride vehicles equipped with lift gates. A regional stronghold with international status, Atelier works directly with major cultural institutions, private collections, and national and international galleries. We've had the privilege of handling some of the most prominent art locations, packing and installations of the century, including the renowned Barnes Foundation Collection, the Museum of Modern Art, the Philadelphia Museum of Art, and countless others. So thank you to all five of our sponsors and for our lead sponsor, Atelier FAS. And, uh, and now, let's turn it over to the, uh, to the open house. Thank you, Larry. The evening now features two pre-recorded videos, followed then by a live Q&A session. Don't forget um, to fill up that Q&A box with your questions while you're watching the videos. Those are the cues that are going to fuel the conversation for later. The first video reveals how conservation treatment and historical research are intertwined at CCAHA. And to introduce the first project is CCAHA paper conservator, Chloe Hausman. Hi, Chloe. Hi, Stephanie. Thanks so much for that introduction. Please tell us about the artifact in your project. Of course. Well, this is a lobby card, uh, which is like a small movie poster, if you can think of it that way. Uh, so it would have been displayed in the front, front of house at a movie theater to talk about upcoming releases. Uh, and I talk about that a little bit more in the video, so I don't wanna get in too deep, uh, but it's incredibly interesting. We've been fortunate enough in recent uh, years to work on a number of artifacts from a similar collection. So we've really gotten to know this type of object. Hi, I'm um, Lee Price, Director of Development at the Conservation Center for Art and Historic Artifacts, and I'm here today with Chloe Hausman, who is our paper conservator, and we're going to be looking at this particular object, and it's the first time that I've actually seen the object. Uh, I, I, I completely infatuated with the object, and that's why I'm here today, because um, I'm kind of the resident CCAHA um, classic film enthusiast. And um, when we get in um, material like this, um, in, the, in this particular case, we received a number of African-American posters and lobby cards and press kits um, dating back from the early 1900s all the way up to the 1970s. And Chloe's been involved in, uh, well, you were, you were, um, yeah, all of them. Really. You were involved with all of them. So um, could, could you introduce it? Absolutely. This particular object is a lobby card from a film called Lemhaken's Confession, as you can see, and it's from 1935. Uh, this particular film was produced by the Oscar Michaud, I believe is the pronunciation uh, film company. But yes, this particular object came to us from, yet yeah, like Lee said, a client who has sent us many similar objects in the past little, little over a year. Um, and this one came in with a number of condition issues that we wanted to address. So unlike now, in its completely treated state, when it first arrived, it had, uh, you know, th this area in the bottom is a loss that's not original paper, and someone had filled it with just a very thick, just bright white paper, so it was very uh, noticeable and distracting. Uh, it also had a number of scratches in the media. Uh, one example was here in the woman's shirt, uh, also here in this uh, gentleman's overalls that were white and again just very distracting. It had also been completely lined on the back with another piece of white paper. Uh, I'm assuming because it's, you know, it's a relatively thin uh, for a lobby card, which would have meant, which would have been made to sort of sit upright, kind of how it is now in a lobby. <laughs> Uh, so it probably was done for a little bit more just strength, but again, it was very thick. The adhesive was thickly applied. Uh, I removed that and underneath actually found evidence of another previous lining 
so there were like patches of other old adhesive and <laughs> more paper so it just this is like an onion it's got layers <laughs> So that was important for us to take off because it really didn't need it and it wasn't contributing in a positive way to the stability of the object. So I removed the backing, uh, removed the old fill, uh, mended any tears, which there are a couple. There's one small one up here that's a little bit covered by my clip that I mended with mulberry paper and wheat starch paste, which are both very stable uh, and have great aging properties. So they're not gonna cause <laughs> They're not going to cause this object any problems in the long run, basically. Uh, I also toned toned the fill that I mentioned before with uh, liquid acrylics to the base tone of the object. We didn't we didn't want to you know sort of recreate what would have been in the lost area of media due to ethical reasons. So the best that we can really do is just have a basic tone there to represent you know the whole sheet of paper. One important component of this treatment was in-painting, uh, and what that is is using removable paints and pigments to add color in areas where it's been lost. Uh, there were a number of small scratches and areas where the color had broken due to handling, so cracks had kind of developed uh, that I had to uh, restore in that, in that way. There are a couple of examples like in the torso of the woman lying down as well as her face has some smaller cracks uh, and then vertically sort of through the overalls of the gentleman kneeling over her as well. This isn't a treatment that would necessary that's like necessary for the stability of the object it's more for uh, visual just unification uh, to make one's eye not be distracted by the damage to be able to see the object for what it is and not uh, have too much focus pulled away. So this is what the back of the object looks like. Uh, as you can see there are different areas like here and down here where the back is sort of darker or lighter and that is because uh, this was previously lined and also underneath the overall paper lining that was all over the back had remnants of a previous lining that were also adhered and some of the areas where that lining wasn't had been previously skinned so like the top layer of paper fibers had been disturbed or slightly removed uh, so there are areas like like yeah down here where this paper is, is quite smooth and probably pretty similar to what it was intended to be whereas this large zone up at the top is, is mostly skin, so it's got a rougher feel and a slightly lighter color because that sort of coating of the paper is gone. Uh, and also in the bottom right corner here, you can see the back of the fill that I did. Uh, so I put paper on either side of the object for this fill. Uh, I put a piece of untoned mulberry paper on the back that you can see here that slightly overlaps the edge of the loss to have a little bit more support and to hold the toned piece of paper on the front in place that one I was able to cut exactly to the shape of the loss with no overlap or very minimal overlap. What's most on the treatment for this if you want to talk a little bit about its history? If you were to see this movie in 1935, um, you're not going to, um, you're not going to the white mainstream Hollywood movie theaters. Right. You're go. It's it, you're you're living in segregated Jim Crow America at that time, and there are black theaters, and this is really Oscar Michaud is really making his films to be shown in the black theaters, but the black theaters they're only around three hundred. This is the the Great Depression. It's right. it's um, not a good time for any business. So there's not much money to be made in this. And most people who go into, and this is called the race film, they're called race films. So if you're coming into a black theater in 1935, yeah, this is going to be promoting probably that it's going to be playing next week. They're going to get the, the lobby card, the posters, they're going to get them in advance to promote the movie. Right, because it's not like you had a YouTube preview that you could check <laughs> right. out for all of the hot new releases. Uh, so this was, you'd go to the theater and see, oh, Lobby Card, Lundhoff is contestant, that looks good, maybe I'll see that next week. And you might very well recognize the name Oscar Michaud if you are going to, if you're a regular attendee of this of the theater there. 
Um, he's probably, they, they probably show Oscar Michaud films regularly. They may show them regularly? They, yes. Okay. okay, I'm sorry. If you're going into the movie theater in 1935 to see Lem Hawkins' Confession, um, you're, you're going to... You're, you're going to know a number of things in advance that um, a contemporary audience nowadays doesn't know. And that's another thing that just throws people off when they're approaching a film like this. This is, it says it's based on the Stanfield murder case. That isn't exactly it. That's um, the name in the film. It's the Stanfield murder case. But it's based on the Leo Frank case. It was a very famous case um, from 1913. And it would be pretty obvious, even just from the pictures, that that's what this was going to be about. Um, the, the Leo Frank case was basically the OJ case of that time, and people knew all about it all across the country. And they knew going in that they were going to be watching a movie that was probably going to end there, there are three main characters. Well, there's the, the woman here who's dead in the picture. So the, the, the black janitor is finding the woman on the floor strangled. Who did it? A lot of evidence seems to point towards the factory owner who is Jewish. There's a lot of both anti-Semitism running in the background of this. And there's a lot of just plain racism running in the background of this. You're going into this film, much like an audience would go in nowadays to see a movie like Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. You know the Manson family. You know how it's going to end. You, you, you know it. It's, it's just part of the culture. So at the end of the movie, Oscar Michaud pulls the rug out from under you and he doesn't end with the lynching because he says... If you go on your snap judgments, if you go on your automatic assumptions that you think you know all about this because of your background prejudices, you're just plain wrong and you killed a man unjustly. You have Oscar Michaud here who never shied away from letting his personal feelings be known. And unlike, the, unlike, unlike white mainstream Hollywood, that was scared to take on an anti-lynching message, Oscar Michaud jumped at the opportunity to deliver an anti, a message like that whenever possible. He's, um, he's one of the great American filmmakers and it's just, um, just a, a real privilege to um, you know, be able to highlight the, the, the importance of his work. Thank you, Chloe and, and Lee. That was fascinating. That was a real exploration of the history and the materiality of paper artifacts like that that come to the center. Thanks so much for sharing that. To introduce our next pre-recorded video is Diani Feige, who is Director of Preservation Services. Hi, Diani. Hi, thank you. So uh, we're gonna change gears here just a little bit. Um, as my department often does, we don't do the hands-on treatment work of objects and materials, um, but we do, uh, we're kind of the education and outreach component. So we develop CCAHA's programming opportunities as well as work with institutions, sometimes on kind of a, a bigger picture level. Uh, but as Stephanie mentioned, my name is Diani Feiga. I'm the Director of Preservation Services at CCAHA. In working with organizations representing countless topics and populations, CCAHA staff have developed a passionate appreciation for documenting and giving voice to the vastly different experiences chronicled in these collections. As staff responsible for the preservation of our nation's stories, CCAHA's preservation services team really understand our critical role in the protection and interpretation of these voices. So with that in mind, we at CCAHA will be coordinating and convening a virtual colloquium on March 23rd and 24, 2021 to explore issues of diversity and inclusion in collections care writ large, preservation, conservation, collections management, et cetera. Since we recognized 
that there are already others out in the field working on initiatives like this day to day, we decided that our team would benefit from assembling an advisory panel to help build the program agenda and drive conversations. The panel includes representatives from different aspects of collecting and collections care from folks all over the country with a variety of backgrounds. While diversity and inclusion initiatives are sometimes developed to change the public face of an institution, this colloquium will be more concerned with the importance of the availability of diverse voices and cultures on more of an internal basis, not necessarily focused on exhibits and outreach, as the stewardship of collections ultimately affects the actual stories of the collections items as they progress through time, the cultures that created the items must be respected in the strategies that are used to preserve them. And the collecting institution itself should really be able to communicate its mission and stewardship commitment to its present day community. So I am delighted now to introduce the interview that I recorded with one of our colloquium advisory panel members, Sandra Phoenix. Sandra is the executive director of the Historically Black College and University Library Alliance. And we at CCAHA are also incredibly fortunate to have her serving as one of our board members. Unfortunately, she won't be here this evening for the Q&A portion, but I will be happy to try to field any questions that you might have about the colloquium or our work behind it. So enjoy the video. Hi, Sandra, how are you? Hi, Danny, I am well. How are you? I'm very well, thank you. Thank you Great. so much for joining us. Um, and so I mentioned a little bit to our audience uh, a little bit about the colloquium on diversity and inclusion in collections care that we at the Conservation Center are coordinating. And I mentioned that you are serving on the advisory panel for this colloquium. I wanted to start out by just asking if you could share why are you serving on the panel for us, with us? Thank you, Deanna. Well, first, let me just thank you and CCHA for this opportunity. Know that the HBC Library Alliance is so pleased to be a part of these much needed and relevant conversations. I also want to tell you just briefly about the work of the HBC Library Alliance. The Alliance is a membership organization for historically Black colleges and universities. The organization is a voice of capacity, a voice of advocacy, for our members. And I say that boldly because of the work that we do, developing library leaders, preserving collections, and planning for the future, all while promoting the value, the significance, the relevance, the need of historically Black colleges and universities. My service on this panel is a learning experience for me, to hear from many voices and to share my voice. I am hopeful that we can be honest and open, challenge our thinking, and then create some needed change, some actionable items that can advance this community. Wonderful. So a big part, as, as you know well, a big part of investing in diversity and inclusion within a professional field has to do with reaching younger individuals while they are making decisions about their academic pursuits and professional goals. Can you please share how the work of the HBCU Library Alliance is impacting the collections care field? Thank you, Diani. That is such a great question. The Alliance is invested in diversity and inclusion through our summer conservation preservation internship project. I am so excited about that work as it impacts students, impacts faculty, uh, librarianship, and even the broader community. Also, our institutions do this individually. Uh, they use student workers and introduce them to librarianship, including collections care. And these somewhat kind of behind the scenes experiences of the daily operations and services of libraries sometimes provide a career interest in librarianship. So we are impacting the field through this partnership with the Winter Tour University of Delaware program in art, in art conservation. And through this partnership, we receive 
three rounds of funding to coordinate fully funded eight week summer internships in library and archives preservation at nationally recognized sites around the country. I do want to give a shout out and thank our board member, Debbie Hess Norris at the University of Delaware for, for securing this funding and really to engage students in these activities and then to expose them to sites around the country and then to expose those sites to these distinguished, esteemed students. So there are students that with an interest in humanities and art and sciences who learn and practice library preservation skills. We look for students with an interest in libraries, archives, uh, history, the arts, and who have an attention to detail. Uh, however, I'm really pleased to share with you that students with an interest in forensic science, the medical field, and computer science have applied for the project. And typically we see an average of 25 student applications per year with students at times reaching out to me before the call to for applications is shared with the membership option. Okay. A selection committee comprised of board members and representatives uh, from our host sites review applications and then make decisions. And I have the distinct pleasure, Diani of a brief interview with each selected intern. They are an amazing set of students. They are highly energized. They are eager to learn and they all carry close to the HBCU vibe. They're being nurtured. They are making advancement for their communities. They are sharing, they are uplifting their community. So students have interned at the, the American Philosophical Society Library in Pennsylvania, at Duke University in North Carolina, at the Harry Ransom Center at the University of Texas, at Harvard, at Kansas University, at the Library of Congress at the University of Virginia, at Winter Tour, and at Yale. The Alliance completed the third round of summer inter internships in June, and of course this was virtual. Students met weekly, or sessions presented by their mentors. They worked together on a project and after eight weeks presented a final session. Diani, the 2020 session was amazing, gratifying and impactful. It gave me and the other team members such great pride and appreciation to experienced students as they spoke to the value, the need for conservation preservation and their work around inclusion. Several interns are now seriously considering library careers and the HBC Library Alliance is pleased to impact student success, to reach younger students, and to be able to assist them while they're making important decisions about their professional goals, hopefully to include librarianship. That is fantastic. And just hearing about the this work directly from you makes me even more excited about <laughs> the the future of our profession. And so we just have time for one final question. And it's kind of a big one, but I was just hoping that you could share with us, getting back to thinking about our colloquium, some of your thoughts on what you hope the colloquium might accomplish for our field. Um, so that's, that's, that's really a big question. And I have to say, I kind of struggle with, with that thinking because, you know, as we, as we talk about DEI, um, which is, um, an ongoing process, um, uh, a learning experience, challenges, victories, battles, and, and somewhere even in between all of that. So I sort of struggle with that. But for me, when I think about the colloquium, what I would like to, um, experience is uh, an in inspiring, uh, empowering event um, where we can really have conversation about all aspects of librarianship, um, the hiring pieces of it, um, the seats at the table that make decisions, uh, the funding opportunities, and of course, the care of our most unique collections and the diversity within, within collections is important as well and making sure that uh, people are recognized for their uh, uh, participation to those collections and for their contributions. So I'm really hopeful that the colloquium will uh, allow me to learn from you, you to learn from me, all of us to learn from uh, 
each other and then guide our movement as we work toward um, what we want to achieve with DEI. And then in doing so, it should be um, possible that we advance this more authentic narrative of American history. We fill in the gaps of history by talking together and learning together and sharing together. So um, I sort of struggle with that, but that's really what I'd like to see um, accomplished. Well, that's wonderful. And I, I wanna thank you so much for that response and for having the, the confidence in us and the program that we're putting together that we can at least begin to grapple with some of these issues. I was drawn to your use of the word conversation, and I do want to mention that that's we one of the decisions that we at CCAHA made kind of alone behind the scenes before we even started working with the panel was to very consciously approach this as a conversation. It's not it's not a conference, it's not a a lecture presentation. It's a colloquium that we hope can be a conversation, a series of conversations, you know, that will happen in March, but hopefully continue on into the future. Indeed. Indeed. So thank you so much for your time today, and but also much bigger and more significant than that. Thank you for serving on the advisory panel with us. And um, thanks so much for everything that you do, Sandra. It was really lovely talking to you. Thank you, Deanna. It was lovely talking to you as well. You take good care and be safe. Thanks. You too. Take care. Bye-bye. Thanks, Deanna. And, and to Sandra, too, for spending that time with us. Um, that was really nice that you two were able to have that conversation on Zoom. We're doing so much virtually, and I am with you all in that 2020 has had some really amazing revelations. And for us at the center, it was really difficult initially to think about putting educational programming on, into a virtual pro, pro platform. However, after several months of having worked through how to do that, I can share um, with so much happiness that we have expanded exponentially our audiences at CCAHA. So folks from the West Coast, spanning through the country, through Mexico to Europe, as far as the Middle East and Africa are now joining us on our webinars and in our open houses. So thanks to the audience tonight, um, new friends and future friends for participating with CCAHA in this virtual platform that we have found to be really kind of exciting and fun. Um, looking forward to the colloquium and working with you in to get that program together for March of 2021. So to conclude our evening, um, I would like to call back um, Chloe and Lee, Diani, you're already here, so unmute yourself. Um, we are now going to have a live Q&A session. I hope you have filled up the Q&A box with lots of questions. And to moderate this session, uh, I'm going to call Larry back. And we also have CCAHA board member Debbie Hess Norris with us. Debbie, actually, and I, I didn't know this until doing a bit of research before the open house, but you started your career at CCAHA as an assistant conservator. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, now you are chair and professor of photograph conservation in the art conservation department at the University of Delaware. Debbie has chaired the American Institute for Conservation Ethics and Standards Committee that revised the code of ethics and guidelines for practice. And she has served as president. With numerous publications to her name, Debbie has lectured and taught around the world. It's so nice to see you tonight. Thank you for, for coming in to the program. And I am going to now turn the Q&A session over to Debbie and Larry to have um, a lively conversation with, with staff. Okay, um, can you all hear me? Mm -hmm. Thank you, Stephanie. And um, 
one thing just to say, I, I did my first position outside of graduating was at CCHA and I joined the board in 1997 and I've never left. <laughs> so, um, this is such an extraordinary organization and uh, a talented staff deeply committed to the preservation of our cultural heritage um, activities that are needed now more than ever as conservation has a capacity to bring voice to the voiceless as we heard in that panel and um, to engender joy and, and celebrate memory, build cultural understanding. So it's a time where we need the preservation of cultural heritage, I believe now more than ever. And I'm, I'm so grateful to the Conservation Center for everything that they've done for me throughout my career. And so many of our students and emerging conservators as well who have had a chance to study with this fantastic staff in, um, throughout the entire center. So um, Larry and I are going to moderate the Q&A and we urge um, all of you to um, insert questions of, of all kinds, can be focused on the presentations you heard or a little bit broader as well. I'll, I'll start Larry and then you can jump in um, with a question for Chloe that is actually in the Q&A and it is, um, Chloe, about your treatment, which really looked quite stunning. It was such a, a great job on the lobby card. Can you talk a little bit um, about how you matched the insert and um, yeah, how, did, how did you go about doing that as a conservator? And I'm gonna add a little bit more to that from my point of view and a okay. little bit about in painting in general. What do you think about when you are either inserting uh, the corner as you did or retouching some of those scratches? Absolutely. Uh, I think that in painting is something that, or color matching more broadly, that just really takes a lot of practice. Uh, conservators for most programs are required to have some sort of background in fine art. And I think that to some extent helps, you know, having a knowledge of color theory, how different pigments and colors interact with one another, uh, but also being able to look at, look at a color and say, I'm pretty sure I can take a guess at what the component colors that were used to mix it were. Uh, and it's, once you really get that eye, it's pretty easy. Well, sometimes, sometimes it's very hard uh, <laughs> to get at least a, Oh, I had I had a, a color match the other day that was just not cooperating. Uh, so I say I say it gets easier with time, uh, but it's it always can be challenging. Uh, but yeah, we have a variety of different tools that we use for in painting generally. Uh, in this case, I used acrylic li li acrylic liquid uh, pigments for the fill and for the areas of loss in the actual image uh, with where the cracks were. I used watercolors. Uh, especially aesthetic treatments like that, uh, we aim to be more reversible. Uh, so in that case, you know, the in painting could be taken off with a damp swab. <laughs> if, you know, so, if another future conservator needed to. Yeah, yeah, I think it's so amazing. And and sometimes, you know, on this format, we can't show you all the tools. But I wish um, you had a chance to see the kinds of brushes that Chloe would have used in in painting. These are like triple zero, tiny, tiny, tiny brushes. Often as conservators, we may be in painting even under a microscope, which is difficult with color matching, but that work was, was just mm -hmm. beautiful. So, so thank, thank you. you. Yeah, I think there's that joke of like the conservator using the brush with one hair and that's not too far from the truth. <laughs> I'm gonna, I'm gonna uh, introduce a question of my own because so far we haven't received a whole lot of questions from the audience and I have one that's, uh, that kind of occurred to me. So, um, and this is probably for Lee. Um, I assume that this lobby card was from a private collection? Um, in, an institutional collection. An institutional collection. And, and I'm just kind of curious, we're all, we're all aware of movie posters, but I don't think I've ever really thought of the existence of lobby cards before. So it's kind of like a new um, a new genre, I guess, to me. Are there collections of lobby cards and posters in, in museums and libraries across the country? Because I don't think I've ever seen one. I think most of them are probably in private hands. They're extremely popular. I have friends, um, as, as I mentioned before, I'm in the, class, in the classic film community. And there are a lot of collectors within the classic film community. And I have friends who collect um, lobby cards um, just as enthusiastically as, say, Debbie collects um, Beatles memorabilia, they, <laughs> which, which he does. Um, so so there, 
are there that many in institutional settings? Probably more in, you know, it's growing steadily over time. This is a 20th century art form. And now we're, so it's really just starting to pass into institutional hands at this time. Um, lobby cards are definitely ephemera. You're, we're dealing with material that was never made to last. And, you know, it wasn't created to last. It was created to serve as a brief advertisement for this material. And um, just so often it's that ephemeral material that you never think of keeping that ends up to be of such um, great historic value. And that's uh, definitely pieces that we want to preserve. But unfortunately, they're also created usually with cheap materials. And so they don't, they, you know, the, we, we face a lot of challenges with trying to conserve um, ephemera. So thanks. Oh, Danny, if ahead. I could just add really quickly, um, one uh, collection that I worked with, I did a preservation needs assessment that had a very cool collection of library cards. I don't know if I ever even talked to Lee about this specific aspect of their collection, is the um, Indiana University, Purdue University of Indianapolis has the Center for Ray Bradbury Studies. <clears throat> And Ray Bradbury collected ephemera of his own, you know, the, the films that were, were made from his publications and everything. And so they actually have um, not massive, but a, a very cool and uh, substantial collection of lobby cards specifically for adaptation, adaptations of Ray Bradbury films. Thank you. So sort of a, a follow-up, I'm looking, we're starting to get a lot of great questions and um, we could be here for hours. I, I, I wish we could and address all these because there's so many important topics here, but sort of following up on the whole idea of, of preservation, Charlie Carl writes that he has a collection of World War II posters, um, similar, I suppose, to the lobby card, larger, that were displayed at post offices. Sadly, they've been folded over three years. Um, is there any hope for them? So I think anyone on the screen could sort of speak a little bit to issues around the conservation treatment of posters. You know, typically we find them folded and housed in uh, difficult environments. And, and what are some of the suggestions that you might have? Certainly, uh, the, the lobby card that we talked about earlier is actually from uh, an institution that I think I mentioned in the video has sent us a number of other film ephemera, including a lot of posters. So I've actually done a lot of conservation work with posters uh, recently. And I would say there's absolutely hope for them. Uh, I mean, I can't say 100% without seeing them, I suppose, but something that's folded, we have ways of safely unfolding and flattening. Uh, if it's got rips or tears, that's something we can address as well. Uh, unfortunately, posters are not always the highest quality paper. Uh, a lot of papers made from wood pulp, which are most most modern papers, I would say, uh, become more acidic over time because of the components of the paper itself. So that causes papers to become, you know, sort of more yellowed or brittle, like picture an old paperback book, like that's the kind of degradation we're talking about. Uh, so I mean, there are there are hurdles to overcome, certainly, but I, I don't think Based on what you said, folded, not hopeless. <laughs> this is probably a related question. I mean, this, it is a related question, uh, and mm -hmm. we may already have answered it, but it says, what problems do you anticipate with conserving modern film memorabilia or posters? Are there materials you're concerned about for their future stability? Yeah, well, kind of like I said, a lot of these papers aren't going to be extremely high quality because they're not really intended to be something that's going to last. Like, you know, movies are coming out all of the time or they were, who knows what's happening anymore. <laughs> but, uh, you know, there's a big uh, rotation in that kind of way. So it's not like you're keeping it up for a long period of time. So it's not worthwhile to use like a really beautiful high quality paper. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's the problem with any kind of ephemera co collection you can really think of. Uh, so so yeah, just just poor quality and also there's a huge variety, like a number of the posters that we treated at CCAHA span, you know, from the like 40s, I think, up until almost present day. And the, the, the quality and type of paper varies widely in terms of like 
thickness, paper coating, like being matte or kind of shiny, like there's a big, big range that can happen as well. So there's a lot of considerations with this type of, of item. Yeah, this is a, a question, I guess, for you and about the colloquium. And that was really such an exciting opportunity, I think, for everyone who's going to participate in that in that conversation in March. Can you talk a little bit about it? Seems that it's going to focus a, a bit on um, the preservation of unknown, undiscovered, underserved, um, underrepresented collections and, and our effort to give a voice to the voiceless. And can you talk a little bit about um, projects that we might have conducted at CCHA where um, we have begun to address these challenges of these incredible collections that are housed in so many institutions across the United States and really around the world? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I can think of a, a number of different examples, but one, one of my favorite projects that um, to, to this day, it's been one of the kind of most gratifying experiences of the Conservation Center and an organization that we continue to have a very good relationship with. Uh, the William Way LGBT Community Center in Philadelphia. So this, it, they, they have been collecting materials, both records of their organization and just materials related to the, the queer scene in the Philly area for decades and decades. Um, but it was very much a community archive effort. It was not managed for, for many years by professionally academically trained archivists or, or collections managers. Um, and so through a grant from the William Penn Foundation, they were able to hire a professionally trained archivist who um, did, did a lot in terms of, you know, initial processing of the collection. And I worked directly with him to write a number of policies and materials for them. And uh, they are such a fortunate example of an organization that even once that initial grant funding ended, they were able to keep him on, their archivist, as a staff member. And so he has kind of um, in his role there, he has kind of taken on somewhat of a responsibility of going out into the community and working with other community archives. And so I think one thing that I think is really exciting is when a project and initiative is kind of built from the ground up right by the people who are actually experiencing. It's not an, a university going out and collecting things that represent a community or population, but it's it's individuals who are there. It's a community center. They're they're going to this community center for events and art exhibits, and um, but they were able to kind of leverage the extremely rich and significant history they had there into something that has over the years become kind of more formalized. So. Um, yeah, definitely. If you're in the Philadelphia area, or well, now, who cares where you are? Check out the the William Way. It's the John J. Wilcox Archives at the William Way Community Center in Philadelphia. Thank you. Thank you, Larry. You have yep. So, actually, I have a question that that uh, it it kind of springs from Lee's presentation. It says, "How much historical research do conservators need as they do their work?" But it also occurs to me, like all four nights this week, um, all of the presentations involved a certain amount of explanation of background. And some of the things were relatively obscure that I think the, the average educated person um, probably didn't know a lot about that. And the, the background was useful in, in appreciating the objects. So kind of like an open question. Um, for conservators, how much historical research is needed when you approach an object um, that comes in for treatment? Well, uh, I, I will say we were very fortunate to have Lee for this particular object because he is so knowledgeable about film and took the time to, you know, look at this particular film as well and get that get that info. Uh, I will say it, I don't have as much time as I would always like to really look into the history and, you know, context of an item that I'm treating. Sometimes it's unavoidable uh, because I need that context to understand an object or how it was made. But I, I would say uh, at CCAHA, we 
we strive to understand the things that we work on. And I think all, cons all conservators or most conservators I know anyhow really enjoy history and enjoy knowing about this kind of thing, but it's not, it's not like a baked in part of our, our work necessarily. Like we will do historical studies or research or technical uh, uh, research and that sort of thing sometimes, but most, most treatments don't get this level of detail, I guess I would say. Well, my, my job is um, different than the conservators, very different. I'm the director of development at the Conservation Center. And most directors of development are concerned with raising money for the institution they work for, but that's only half of my job. The other half of my job is to help institutions raise money for this type of project. So say over the past few nights, um, I've worked on several with, I was working with these institutions before um, they were definitely bringing anything to us when they were trying to raise money. I'm, I'm frequently helping with grant writing assistance with, with projects like this. And with grant writing assistance, um, frequently I have to help them determine the project scope. And we're also looking for um, the stories that can really sell um, the, the grant that we're going to write so that the funders will be particularly interested in it. So it'll be a memorable presentation. And that means that I end up uh, doing research is a pretty normal part of it. Um, and I really wanted to share about um, Lem Hawkins' confession, um, something that um, I, the hook that I would use to sell it in a, um, if I was doing a, a grant request for, um, for raising money for treatment of it, um, I probably wouldn't go, I, I used material that I presented as background. I do think it's interesting material, but since that time um, I've come across some information and put it together, I think in a unique way. It turns out that Lem Hawkins' confession is the first, is the um, oldest surviving feature film produced by an African-American woman. Now, when you see the lobby card, the lobby card has A. Burton Russell Presents in the left corner. And then over on the side, it has the cast list and 11th down on the cast list is Alice B. Russell. Alice B. Russell is Mrs. Oscar Michaud. And he and she is A. Burton, the B, Alice B, A. Burton Russell presents. So she is the uncredited producer of this. With two of his other films, he did, he credited her also. He did it with a, um, a short that he did in 1929, and he did it with a feature film in 1930. The short exists, the feature does not exist, and there just aren't that. I, I, I'm, I'm fairly confident that this would be um, first, first um, oldest surviving feature film um, produced by an African American woman, which I just think is a wonderful thing. This is, by the way, a peripheral question that somebody submitted, but I'm going to ask it. I'm going to pose it to Lee anyway. It says, "Where can see? Where can we see more of the films that are talked about in the video?" Um, Okay, Lem Hawkins' confession, if you did a Google search for it, it would come up as Murder in Harlem. That is the name that it went by <laughs> when it was, see, uh, Oscar Michaud wanted to call it um, Lem Hawkins' confession. And it was released as Lem Hawkins' confession in the New York metropolitan area in 1935. And that's probably where the lobby card is coming from. But then it's um, distributed through SAC Enterprises and they have they had a lot of strength down south, going into the southwest, where the name Har the word Harlem would get a lot of attention. And so they insisted on retitling it Murder in Harlem. You can see it on YouTube. It's a lousy print. And frankly, Oscar Michaud films, I love them, but it it you have to go in realizing they were done on very, very cheap budgets. So um, it's not like watching um, it's not like watching a normal budgeted Hollywood film. Um, you you do have to give it some leeway that way. All right, thanks, Lee. On YouTube, if I could just add something to the previous question, and I can't speak about my experience as a conservator because I'm not. But um, something that we are hoping to address in the colloquium I was discussing is 
um, the sometimes the the very important relevance and importance of um, understanding the history of of not only an artifact but also perhaps the community it represents. We had um, one of our panel members for the advisory panel was working as a fellow at the National Museum of the American Indian, and I know that their conservation team does a great deal of work of working with representatives of the American Indian population to understand, you know, how was this object used? How, what is the significance of this object that we may have missed just by looking at it? And so, you know, I think that's, I think it's always an important aspect, but I think it's maybe even gains kind of a different level of importance when we're talking about working with collections that, that might not reflect our past. Yeah, I mean, we always talk about the critical importance of context in all the work that we do and those dialogues locally and globally are really essential, I think, to um, successful preservation and, and preservation that's a true partnership in so many ways. I don't know, Stephanie, how are we doing on time? Oh, I was just getting ready to hop back in. We have quite time for one more question. There's one that I think could be really quickly answered. Um, okay. It says, has it been considered to digitize these types of items as an alternative? And I, not being a conservator, I probably could answer that, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna throw that out anyway. Well, I, I, since I'm not a conservator either, I'm gonna give a really quick answer too, mm -hmm. and, um, and just say it depends on what your purpose is. If your purpose mm -hmm. is because you want the content, because you want the words that are on a piece of paper, Sure, fine, digitize it. But if, if that piece of paper itself matters as an object, then it's a whole different story. And then now I'll let the real experts answer, Chloe. <laughs> no, that, that's great, Diani, and you're absolutely correct. Uh, digitization is a super important part of conservation, I would say, uh, and also access for folks who maybe mm -hmm. can't go see something physically or for an item that isn't physically on display anywhere. Uh, but yeah, in cases like this, where the institution wanted to be able to display this item particularly. They wanted me to address some of the structural issues, some of the previous conservation treatment it had received that might not be the best going forward. And like I said in the video, some of the aesthetic issues. Uh, so these are things that, especially more on the structural side, will be good for this piece of paper, like, like Diani said, going forward. Uh, and also there are absolutely cases where it might not be safe to digitize an item in its current mm -hmm. condition status. So conservation might be necessary for digitization to even be possible. Mm -hmm. And I would think that in a lot of cases, you could of course do both. You can preserve the, you can preserve the material and digitize it at the same time. Absolutely. And that's one reason we always take before and after treatment photos of everything we work on at CCAHA, both for our own accountability and also if a client wants those records, they can request those from us and have mm -hmm. digital copies of their items. We, we always talk in the field about balancing preservation and access and digitization gives you the incredible access around the world to these collections and, and um, but we still need to preserve the originals. And as a photograph conservator, I just have to put that out there because there have been so many photographic collections and, that have not been saved because the sense has been we can digitize these and make them available and we don't need to preserve the originals. And the digital copies deteriorate, they're never the same as the originals. And, um, and what I think CCHA does so well and, and um, certainly is represented here is that balance. Um, to ensure that we meet the needs of access so people can see and learn from these materials and, and build knowledge and excitement, but also preserve the originals for future generations. Absolutely, an image is not a substitute for the original object. Thank you all for that really lively conversation. I, I have to add that when Lee says he is a film enthusiast, he is not kidding. My office has been across the hall from his for years. And every Friday afternoon, I would get a film recommendation for the weekend. <laughs> and since I've been working at home and you know, since March, I haven't had one. So this session was really enjoyable for me because Lee got to share his recommendations um, for a film this weekend. Thanks, Lee. Thanks to all of you, Debbie, Larry, Lee, Chloe, and Diani. 
for this Q&A session. Tonight's particular assemblage of presentations and expertise reveals the wide reach of CCAHA work and the interconnected success of a continued mission for long-term preservation of our shared cultural heritage. This concludes the evening's presentations. Thank you again to the 2020 Open House sponsors, Atelier, your part-time controller, Diversified Storage Solutions, Innovative Document Imaging, and the Cheshire Law Group. These sponsors enabled CCAHA to present the open house and to engage with the audience in really exciting and completely unique ways. Thank you from all of us at CCAHA for joining this celebration, all four days of it in some cases. Um, this has been a celebration of treatment, advocacy, research and education in the preservation and conservation field. We hope to see you in person again soon, again virtually in the meanwhile, and at any time when you reach out to us via email, phone, or social media. And you can always find us at ccaha.org. Until next time, be well all and good night. Thank you, everybody. This was fun. Thank yes, you. Yes, it was. Good night. Good night. Thanks.